Good evening everyone, FPS Chazel here and welcome back to my tutorial series. In this video, we are going to go over basic sonar, well, maybe not basic but introductory, I kind of just want to go over the stations because there's a lot of stuff going on in them and uh, this tutorial is for those, I'm designing it for those who have never played the game so there's a lot of stuff that's going on in those stations that you need to be familiar with before you can even consider jumping in and doing more advanced stuff so let's get to it let's start with the sonar screen here alright so this is your sonar screen this is for American subs this is the broadband screen right here there's six different screens that make up sonar so this is the biggest station on the sub in terms of how much you can do while you're in one station so oh boy where do I even begin okay so I mentioned earlier that we had a tote array. I guess I can try and stream some of that out now. We're in like shallow water right here. So, it, we can save that for later. It's not really, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this tutorial. Um, stuff that regards the tote array, I, I would consider more of an advanced concept for later on. Right now, I'm just kind of trying to go over the basics and familiarize everyone with the interface here. So, yes, this is our broadband screen. Broadband, this just picks up, you know general noise that a, a contact makes. I think this is more like prop noise kind of stuff going on, like the propeller of the ship and just uh, general noise that it might be making. And uh, it outputs it on this uh, this time display here. As you can see, this this is the short interval. This goes from 0 to 30 seconds. So uh, it's continuously updated. So what you see here, this is data. This is something that is not natural. Or, well, it's not part of the background noise. It's something that's showing up here. So, if you hover over it, you probably won't be able to hear this in the video, but I can hear some noise from this right now because audio is on. And this is a contact right here. You, if you go down to the, this is the, the intermediate time interval down here, and this just stretches it out to 30 minutes. The advantage of going to the intermediate time interval is that with the sonar computers, it's easier for the, the sonar software to see a trend uh, in like the longer, the longer time interval here, so it'll show up as bigger and brighter. So for, for more distant contacts, you're going to have to find them on the intermediate time average down here. But for things that are really close, you can use the, uh, the short time average here. So you'll probably be spending most of your time down here on the, the, the intermediate time average. So uh, yeah, this right here flips between back and forth. you got the long too. Don't really use the long too much. Um, I don't know, just, it can just be useful to check out some really long time history there if you want. North center, south center. Uh, that doesn't mean you can only see the north or the south, that means uh, what's in the center of the display here. So since we're going north, we're going due north right now, you probably want north center. Um, this is the this is the baffle right here. So right now we're on the spherical array, which is up here in the in the bow. So it's basically, we're basically just telling it not to listen. Um, let's see, it's better from this way. So uh, obviously the sub is just behind it on, on that part, so we're just telling it not to listen to like a certain cone back here, just don't even pay attention to any of that sound. So that's what this is. This is the baffle or blind spot here. So since it's on north center right now, these baffles are off to the side, so it's just easier to see this stuff. Um, if you're going, you know, due south, you'd have your baffle right here, so you might want to change it, you know, south center there. It just makes it easier to sometimes see what's going on, but we can stay on north center here. Uh, yeah, coming down here, track ID, this is where you designate your targets. Um, so we can go ahead and designate this guy right here. Click designate. It'll mark it as Sierra 1. This is the first um, contact we've made. Sierra means it's a contact that was derived from Sona. And as you can see up here, there's now this A floating over it. That is a tracker. So by doing that, you can cycle through the trackers. On the LA, you have four trackers. You might have one on the Seawolf. And you have four trackers on the uh, Akula too. So each sensor has four trackers. The sphere has four trackers and the toe has four trackers. So yeah, this is tracker A, and what that means is this is going to continuously, um, well not continuously, but the computer is going to um, focus on this contact and every two minutes it's going to send a new line of bearing to the TMA. So when you have, if, if you, cla if, if we had, um, you know, five contacts showing up here, we can only have trackers on four of them. So one of them would not be able to be upgraded or updated continuously. And that's fine. We only have two contacts, so we can mark both of them. So this one's one is going to be Sierra 2. And down here, you just get a better uh, refinement on your cursor position here. Um, you, you can just kind of look and get an estimate, but you, if you drag this along, it will output a refined cursor position. 
And then down here at the bottom we have select array. Um, you can only see broadband data for the spherical and the toad even though we have three arrays on the sub. So uh, moving on, let's move on to narrowband now. So narrowband, this picks up frequency data. It's the same sound, but narrowband focuses more on, you know, like the frequency spectrum. So you're talking about things that are like rotating cyclically, like reactor pumps and stuff like that. That's what that's the kind of stuff that's getting picked up on narrowband here. So if we uh, go back to the broadband here, where, wherever you place your cursor and leave it here, if you go to the narrowband, the cursor will be in the same spot, which is really nifty. So we can just drag that right over here to, to Sierra 1, and it comes up here on the narrowband. So yeah, this is just a frequency output spectrum, which basically means it just shows, in this game it models up to five frequency spectrums, so you can see five different frequencies of a ship. And this right here is what we use to classify ships, because no two, no two, uh, all classes of ship will have a different frequency spectrum, even if it's like very slight. So that's how we can use it to classify ships here. Um, so this contact is really moving kind of rapidly so it's not staying up in the narrowband for very long so let's go over here to CR2 so uh, as you can see this is a weaker contact um, the, the brightness of the green up here signifies signal strength to a degree it basically just shows how well you can hear the contact it's not not indicative of range at all because noise level it's gonna vary from ship to ship you know subs are gonna put out the least amount of noise followed by warships and then merchantmen are the noisiest so right here we got a auto classification filters on right now so it's calling this as a Ticonderoga so I think if we designate that again it'll uh... sometimes if, if you designate the contact here on the narrowband first um, it'll put up the uh... the classification up here but it's not doing it right now so to designate a contact on the narrowband you have to first um, drag this cursor up here in the frequency spectrum over to one of the frequency lines here. Otherwise, it's not really gonna it's not gonna classify it because it's just that's just the way it works in here. That's basically what you need to know about that. Um, I, I'm doing a quick mission right now, so we might be expecting another sub out here. So I'm gonna see if I can find find him to classify him. No, it doesn't seem like I'm finding him. So I'm I'm just gonna drop CR2 real quick, and then I'll classify him to the narrow band, and then it should automatically send the. Uh, the classification to the uh, the nav map there. Oh, I'm I'm trying to search for the ship, and then you don't search for the ship up there. This this just outputs what is on this bearing down here. So whatever this bearing is seeing is what gets output in this in this frequency spectrum up here. You don't search for contacts up here. That's not how that works. So let's find one of these ships. Where is CR2? Right here. So we go right over to that frequency and click designate target. So you can mark it here through the narrowband. And uh, it sends the uh, what it thinks it is right to the it's right to the nav map here. So we got low confidence on the Ticonderoga. So different types of sensors will see different types of frequencies. Spherical is more geared towards higher frequencies. Toad is more geared towards lower frequencies, and I think Informal is more lower frequencies as well. But this is more like middle range too. See, there's a there should be another frequency down here that the Toad would pick up very well, but the Conformal is picking up the middle frequencies better. So. We can go ahead and classify this guy on the conformal as well. So then we got we got this guy on two sensors right now. We got him on broadband and we got him on conformal. So that just gives us further frequency data to um, classify this contact. But uh, yeah, what else do we have on the screen here? So you flip through um, potential classifications in here. As you can see, Tycon is really all that flies through here. You can do north and south center here too, and this lets you switch between arrays. Now. It can be really hard to kind of see what frequency is what, so you can use this frequency scale here to like uh, it cuts it off at a certain point. So if you bring it down here to 500, you can just see some better resolution on the contact here. As you can see, it's like a a wave kind of thing. It's not a straight line because it varies slightly from over time, I guess. So um, you're gonna want to go for about the middle of this wave here. We can zoom even further here, and, you, and it'll show even more of the wave breakdown. But yeah. Aim for the middle of the wave here. This one is a 160. That's what it's supposed to be. Um, this is where you're going to want a frequency sheet. You can find this in the manual section of your install. But uh, yeah, using that, using this, you can figure out what a ship is. This is how you classify a ship without looking at it through the periscope. All right, so I'm going to return to broadband for a second here. Make sure we have a tracker on one of these guys. We do. So since the broadband is what picks up prop noise, we can use that to find out the speed of a ship. 
So, let's see. Okay, I only classified the one guy on the, the narrow band. You cannot get speed data from the narrow band. You have to use it from broadband. Um, and on that note, not, narrow band is much more sensitive than broadband because uh, narrow band picks up distinct, distinct frequencies, whereas broadband is just more or less general noise. So that general noise, is, it, it gets much more easily washed out over distances, whereas the specific frequencies are going to propagate a lot further because they're, they don't blend in with the background as well. So since we have this contact here, well, I guess we can use CR3 here. We have him on the broadband. We can come over here to the demon display. This is demon waterfall. So what you got up here is um, your available trackers. As you can see, it's only four, so each array has four trackers to it. Conformal... I guess I should note this too. Conformal only has a narrow band. There's no broadband on the conformal. Don't know why that is, but it's beyond the scope of this tutorial. So um, you can shift the frequency scale here. You're only going to need these higher frequencies for torpedoes. So you're going to stay on here for mostly 20 frequency for uh, the 20 frequency range. So if we click CR3 here, we start seeing some stuff here on the waterfall. Um, if you went to this, it just shows you more lines. But all you need to classify the speed of a ship is this first line here. I'm not sure what the the point of the other lines are or why they're there, but once again, that doesn't really matter for the scope of this tutorial. If someone wants to chime in, feel free. I'll add an annotation. I just don't know off the top of my head here. So right now we've got a cursor frequency of 10. Um, this means nothing right now. That That is not speed. So since we are pretty sure this guy is a Ticonderoga, we can come here, right-click it, go to the platform reference, and uh, we can see what you're looking for is TPK. This is turns per knot. And this is the other piece of data you need to figure out the speed of the ship. So we've got a TPK of 8. So coming back here to the demon waterfall, we just increase this to 8. And our contact has a speed of 19 knots. He's going pretty fast. So uh, yeah, that's how, the, that's how the demon works. So let's move on to active. Uh, you will almost never be using this on a submarine, at least in terms of primary search. What you're going to want to use active for, maybe if someone snapshots and they're close aboard, and you're not too sure their um, solution, just send out a ping real quick. You can get a, a quick fix and launch a snapshot in retaliation. Or if you're in like the middle of a fleet and uh, it's starting to get really, really thick really quick, you could just light off a ping too and try and get some snapshots off. But um, people will be able to counter detect you with this. Um, they'll be able to see that you're emitting something and they will definitely try and come and investigate. So you have two different options here for pinging. You can send out a single ping and then it'll just turn off or continuous. So if you're on continuous and you click transmit, it'll just keep transmitting over and over. Um, once again, north center and south center. North center is probably fine. Um, you need to just change it to south center if you need it. Range scale, kill yards. So applying our rule of thumb, divide this by 2,000 to get nautical miles. Well, in this case, you would just divide by 2 because it's already divided by 1,000 here because it's in kiloyards. So kiloyards are divided by 2, and then yards are divided by 2,000 to get an approximation for nautical miles. So we've got 40, 20, 10, 5, 2.5 nautical miles here. So I'm going to set it here for 10 nautical miles. Um, this outputs the, the range and, and the, uh, the, the degree. You don't have to worry about that too much. If you mark it, it'll be automatically sent to TMA. All this data goes to TMA. That's why we need this sonar data. Um, it goes to TMA. So let's go ahead and light off a ping here. Give me a ping, Vasily. One ping only, please. So we got two contacts right here. We picked up another contact. We got an we got like a return, but we can't see it. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you'll hear the return, but it's just so faint that you can't see it. Um, if you do it, if you do the continuous ping over time, you might be able to see. Um, it might build up on top of it, and you might be able to see it. this. Might be it right here. No, that's not it. Uh, so it looks like we got two surface ships here. It's not really classifying with new contacts, that's fine. But yeah, we got two active sets right there. So as you can see, we had a bearing on this guy, and now we have range. So that's a very quick way to find range. It's also a very dangerous way to find range. Once again, I would only use it if you're trying to get a quick solution, someone just fired on you, or some other kind of complication uh, requires that you don't sit around and wait for 20 minutes trying to get a solution. You just need to do something now. So we got a ship right here. This is definitely for sure range you can trust this 100 percent so uh, yeah that's how active transmit works once again you'll probably never be using this too much i really don't use this that much but if you're close aboard to someone you need to you can use it uh active intercept 
So surface ships in this game, when the AI is playing as them, they tend to hammer away with pings a lot, which is kind of silly because it gives away their position. Regardless, um, you'll be using this to figure out if torpedoes are like locked onto you, you'll be able to hear their pings. And uh, if ships are pinging, you can use this to, once again, figure out where they are. Um, I just I leave this on auto crew, otherwise you're just going to be sitting here marking pings the whole time. There's no skill to it really. It's just lining this up with a ping, and then you'll see a, a band. This is it has the same look as ESM. You'll see a band. You just press mark, and uh, you got yourself an an active intercept track. Outputs the frequency. Um, the USNI reference tells you what frequencies are what. Um, if it's saying about 3,500 hertz or anything like that, it's coming from a ship. If it's uh, in the 20,000 hertz range, it's probably a torpedo. And if it's over, f no, actually, if it's over the 40,000 hertz range, it's probably a torpedo. And then anything in like the 20,000 hertz range, I think, is like a dipping sonar or maybe an active sonar buoy. But uh, besides the fact that um, it outputs the frequency here, the game has different sounds for different sources of ping. So just by having the game volume on and listening for it, you can tell if you're getting pinged by a torpedo or a surface ship or a sub. Um, yeah, once again, signal level. Bearing, interval, age, age. Um, this tells you uh, when you got the last ping. So you know maybe after after like 30 seconds for a surface ship, you might not be getting pinged anymore. He might have turned or something like that. Interval. Um, if it's getting shorter, that probably means you got a torpedo that's locked onto you. Because with the torpedo, um, I'll get into that later. That's fine. I'm not going to try and clutter this up too much. And then the last thing we got here is the SSP displays the sound speed profile. This shows you where the layer is. And the uh, the layer is a boundary in the ocean that's demarcated by different temperatures, different uh, temperature gradients. So you get this during the day. Um, the top layer will get heated by the ocean and the bottom stays cool. And since uh, hot and cold things have, hot and cold fluids have different densities, when sound hits that barrier, it bends. So, um, that barrier demarcates a layer, a thermocline, uh, where sound either goes through the layer and gets bent. So um, this has depth here, so I'm just going to pretend there's a layer right here. So you could have sound going like this, and it hits this layer, and it bends down like that. So if a ship hears you, they, uh, um, if they're close enough to you, they'll be able to hear you through the layer. But if they're far enough away, it's kind of like how fiber optic cable works. The sound will just keep bouncing up and down. It'll never uh, traverse the layer. So you can use this to your advantage. Um, sometimes people will, and by use this to, to your advantage, I mean if you've got a sub down here, you can get above the layer and try and like stay quiet from him. Or if you've got ships up here, helicopters, you can get beneath the layer and stay quiet from them. Uh, XBT, this is, a, uh, this is how you launch a bathiothermographic probe. Um, and this will just update the, the sound speed profile, but I think it actually updates automatically in the sub, but sometimes I do just like to launch one, just for the sake of it. Alright, um, yeah, that's it for the sonar. Uh, that's it. That's, I think that's all I wanted to go over for sonar, so, uh, yeah, once again, this is just a basic sonar. Ooh, this guy's, like, turned around here. We'll get into that later, how to interpret, um, the lines you see here into, uh, something that makes sense. That's more advanced. I just want to go over the basic interface for this and show you how to do some basic things. So, thanks for watching, everyone. This has been the introduction to Sonar Tutorial. Make sure you stick around for the TMA tutorial. I'll see you then.